grateful and thankful that you guys are here. Hope you've had a good, good week. We had a good time, hope, last Sunday looking at Psalm 8. And we're in Psalm 9 tonight. Psalm 9 is a special psalm in that it is a, it's a declaration that there's a war going on. There's a war going on. It is talking about a time in Israel's life when they turn on their television set. Well, maybe they didn't turn on their television set. A little before that time. They looked at the local news. Maybe they didn't have the news. Maybe they had a town crier. Someone who got the news to them and the news didn't look too promising. You ever felt like that? I think every generation goes through that. Those of you who lived through the 1960s, you might have lived through the 1950s at a time of prosperity after World War II and, and the neighborhoods were a fun place to be and you could play outside and people were doing well and jobs were doing well. And we thought it'd just be like that forever. They tell me I wasn't here, but I heard about it. And then the 60s rolled along and people said, what in the world is going on? And we didn't know whether we'd make it through there. Then the 70s came along and we had a little house on the prairie touched by an angel. We had, uh, we had a resurgence back to the things of God in a way. We need to get back because the 60s really scared us and we had to have the 70s. And then the 80s and the 90s rolled along and we asked again, what in the world is going on? And now we sit here in the year that we live and we can ask those same kind of things. This psalm in the perspective of it is like someone who has watched the news and they're really frightful, they're apprehensive, they try to contemplate what's going on. Now, a long time ago in 19, oh, it's over 80 years ago, 1938, there was an episode on a, a radio program called The War of the Worlds. You remember hearing about that? If any, of you, uh, if any of you over here are saying, yes, I remember re uh, hearing that, uh, I've got to ask about your age, check your ID a little bit. Uh, it was on the, the um, Columbia Broadcasting System. It came on on a Sunday evening, October 30th in 1938. And it was an American radio drama anthology on the Mercury Theater on the Air. Now, there was a time before we had all the technology we have today that people and families sat around in their homes and watched the radio. I know it sounds funny, but they sat around and they watched the radio. There were shows that came on like The Shadow. And some of those folks are still affected by whoever that shadow was. I want to tell you, it must have been pretty scary. And they heard great comedians and they heard great music. But this was on the Mercury Theater of the Air, directed and narrated by an actor and a future filmmaker named Orson, G Orson Welles. And it was an adaptation of H.G. Wells' novel that he, that he wrote, in, wrote in 1898 called The War of the Worlds. Now, it was a dramatic presentation. Orson Welles performed it, and it was broadcast as a Halloween episode the night before Halloween. And the storyline depicts the earth being invaded by Martians, some aliens from Mars who are intelligent beings have been watching the, the earth for a long time. They've been studying us and they've decided to invade earth. And when he begins to talk, and if you remember hearing his voice, he's very convincing. He starts to tell about this, and over the span of that radio program, he describes in great detail what he's doing, what his family's doing, what the government's doing, where everybody's at, where the aliens have landed, and where they're going, and what all they're doing. And it becomes so realistic that a lot of our country thought it was real. They thought it was really happening. Oh no, we have been invaded by Mars. And we had all kinds of chaos because people got up and they, they were scared to death and they ran and they tried to find out what to do. Where were the aliens? Were they in their neighborhood, in their, their state? And it was really an impactful thing in our country because this radio program was so realistic and lifelike in this man you can listen to it, and, and as he performed that, it sounded like it was happening right in front of everybody's lives. 
caused a lot of panic for the listening audience. It was a radio program. It was a show. It was what we would call today fake news. It wasn't real. But I thought about that. 1938, the War of the Worlds. Three short years later, on the radio, we could hear another voice. And it said this from our president, Theodore Roosevelt. December 7th, 1941, a date that will live in infamy. And this was not fake news. This was the announcement that Pearl Harbor in Hawaii had been bombed. That now the United States has entered into World War II. And our world changed forever. Our world changed forever. America was forced into that war by that act there. A lot of other things were taking place at the same time. But I think a lot of people in our country were asking, what is going on? What is happening? Is our world literally cratering right before our eyes? Is it falling apart? It was a very, very important time for our country to rally around each other and together and to fight a common enemy that was set and bent on destroying and I'm thankful that God uh, gave the ability for uh, our nation and some other nations to not be aggressors. We didn't start it, but God allowed us to help finish it. And I'm very grateful for that. I've stood in that place right over the Arizona, and I might have told you before, but I watched my wife take off the little flowers of her lay that they give you when you come to Hawaii, and she was dropping them in the water over the Arizona where many, many people lost their lives and I saw my wife start crying. And I realized her dad had uh, been thrust into the military and that was the moment our country would be fighting in World War II and it altered his life forever. In a few days, I have the privilege of leading a group from Denton Bible Church to Normandy, France. Most of you know what Normandy is and if you don't, study it because we don't ever need to forget and that was where a lot of troops from our country and other countries landed on those beaches in France to help stop the bad guys. My father-in-law was one of those. Pray for that trip if you would. There still is a war of the worlds. And I'm not necessarily talking about nations around us today. We do hear things that are happening in Turkey and Syria and Israel and Iran and Iraq and China. And, and it is frightening, isn't it? We don't know what's going on. We don't know what tomorrow's going to hold. And when we see those things and hear those things, we think, how can I protect my family? What should I do? There's some people that think I'm going to go big, uh, build a great big hole in the ground and I'm going to build a, 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 a prepper room and I'm going to have it in the ground and I'm going to store up all this food and all this water and that's okay. Uh, I would encourage them, don't tell everybody where that's at. Because... <laughs> All of those neighbors that you haven't seen in a long time, they may show up someday and say, hey, can you help me? Can I come and join you? But the Bible does teach there's still a war of the worlds because we're sitting here in a time where there is a spiritual war going on. I'm going to read some out of Daniel before we're through tonight. And Daniel knew what that was about. He had been given visions from God. He is captive and taken to the land of Babylon when Israel had been occupied and overrun. And uh, Daniel is, is given visions that are mighty. God had sent Gabriel, the archangel, one of the angels of God, to come and help Daniel understand. Daniel had that great stand. They passed a law, don't you pray to anyone except this leader of the country. And Daniel said, I can't do that. And he bowed three times a day and he bowed down before God. They threw him in a lion's den. God shut the mouths of the lions. But when that angel came and helped Daniel to understand part of the visions that God had given him, the angel said something interesting. He said, at the beginning of your supplication, at the beginning of your prayer, Daniel, the commandment came forth and I'm sent. In other words, when Daniel started praying, and Daniel prayed like this, not like, oh Lord, forgive everybody else's sin. They're so rotten, they're bad. He started like this, oh dear Jesus, dear Father, please forgive my sin first. That's a good way to pray. Start with us. Please forgive my sin first. And would you forgive the sins of my father and of Israel? 
And the Bible says, that angel said, when you started to pray, the commandment came forth. God just looked over there, pointed and said, get down there and help him. But he said something interesting. He said, the, the prince of Persia withstood me for 21 days. Now he's talking about a spiritual prince, not somebody on this earth. He's talking about demonic activity. He's talking about Satan's crew because there's a war of the worlds. And he says, Michael, your prince came and helped me. Did you know when God wants to end up this whole matter about the earth and, and in eschatology, the study of end times, we find out there's going to be when, a day when God said time's up. That's as true as anything there's going to be. There's going to be a day when God says, okay, this is all I can stand and I can't stand no more. I don't know if you can open up any spinach and eat that like Popeye did, but there's going to be a time when God said time's up. And he's going to call on Michael. Uh, Michael. That's my name. And I used to tell my little brother, you know, how important I was because when you get those little plaques, it says, Michael, like God. My little brother assured me, they need to name you something else <laughs> because you, you're not that much like God. You and I as Christians are in a war. There's a war of the worlds. And that's what this chapter and this psalm is about. God's going to be so descriptive. It is a picture of an Israelite looking at what's going on, and he sees the bad guys seeming to win a lot. He sees the struggle and the problems, and he sees chaos. And it's a picture of that Jew looking up and saying, God, what in the world's going on? What do I do? And then God shows up. Oh, let's look at it together. By the way, let me remind you a couple of verses in the New Testament. The Bible tells us in 1 John 3, 13, do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Jesus said, it hated me before it hated you. We are not supposed to be surprised if we as Christians are persecuted. Now, no, none of us wants persecution. We don't invite that. We have lived a relatively free of persecution life in the United States. But people have warned us, pastors and, and evangelists that have gone before us said, America, realize we are in a very unusual time right now. Don't get used to that. Because people all around the world from all times of all generations that name the name of Christ and are faithful to him have been persecuted. In fact, John wrote, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, shall suffer persecution. Now, we don't want that. We don't say, hallelujah, come, I'm ready to. But we also need to not be ignorant of that fact. And then he says in 1 Peter chapter 4, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. Another version says, think it not strange, this fiery ordeal, because there's a war of the world's. It's not Martians. It's those that have set themselves against Christ, set themselves against God, and it's the church that is called to stand fast. And let's look in Psalm 9, if we might, and let's see. Now think about this. This is like a Jew watching the news, trying to find out, God, what's going on. The Bible says in the first verse, I'll give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of your wonders. I will be glad and exult in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. There are four I wills right there. This first part of this psalm is a declaration of David saying, I am going to tell the world the good things of God. Should we do that too? There's a lot of influence today that tells us we need to be silent. Keep that Christianity to yourself. It's not politically correct. There can be laws against it. Guys, we are never commanded to be silent. Jesus said, what you've heard in the secret, I want you to proclaim it from the housetops. Let the redeemed of the earth say so. And you and I never need to be ashamed. We never need to be afraid. We need to honor our God. And four times in this beginning of this Psalm, David said, I will, I will, I will. And I will. He makes a vow to proclaim how good God is. How many of you watched the movie Courageous? Have you watched that? It's a good movie. I cried all the way through it with my daughter. 
And uh, it, was a, it was a great, great movie. In that end of it, if you remember, when the man is standing in the church service and he's addressing the men, he's reading that resolution about what a, a Christian dad should be. And they are, he's asking men to join the fight, to stand up. And in that, he says, you don't have to ask me who will tell my son about Jesus Christ. I will. You won't have to ask me who will protect my family and I will lead them in church. I will. You don't have to worry about who's going to be the one who teaches them God's word and sees that they live the way Christ wants to. I will. I will. And then that great scene where he asks, I'm asking men to join with me. And all over the church, those men start standing up. They start standing up. Well, that's what David's doing. David's saying, I will. I get calls from time to time. Hey, pastor, I think somebody's ready to come to know Jesus. Can you get over here? And I say, no. You pray with them. Because it doesn't have to be a pastor. It doesn't have to be an evangelist. It could be anyone to pray and encourage someone. But sometimes <coughs> we think we've got to go get a professional. We've got to go get somebody else. No. Did you know some of the greatest sermons that can ever be preached in this room right now are from you? with your life and your testimony. When that man in John chapter nine said, <coughs> excuse me, the, the uh, Pharisees asked him, who is it, chief priest scribes, who is it that, that made you able to see? He said, I don't know. And don't you know he's a sinner? He said, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not, but I know one thing. I was blind, but now I can see. See, his testimony was preaching loudly to those people. And that's something the world cannot deny your testimony. When, they, when you share what you've let Jesus do in your life, they can argue with me about theology. They can argue with Corey over here about church history and things that he's an expert in. They can argue all they want to and we can argue back and forth. But they can't argue that you were blind and now you see. You weren't a good husband, but now your wife says, he's a great husband. So what happened? That's the sermon that people need to hear. And David starts off and he says, I will. I'll give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I'll tell of all your wonders. Wonders are miracles. They are not common. That's when God steps out of the order that he has made and he just trumps that order. He does something different. He does something peculiar. I'm going to tell people about what God has done. I'm going to sing to him. I, from time to time, I say, do you like to sing? And they say, oh, you don't want me to sing. <laughs> well, I want to tell you something God does. My mother, I love her with all my heart. She went into heaven in 1976. And I would sit by her in church from the time I was this tall and bless her heart. Here in Texas, you can say anything after you say bless your heart, right? Bless her heart. Bless her heart. I love her with all my heart. I can't wait to see her in heaven. She was my discipler. She, she lived for Christ. She's a great example. But she could not sing a note. And I still remember sitting next to her and uh, we're singing, holy, holy, holy. And she's singing something. I don't know what it is. And I look up as a little boy and I think, you don't sound like everybody else does. But it doesn't matter how it sounds on the outside. God says, sing, sing. And that's what David's doing. Look at verse three. The next part of this is we're gonna see the character of God. By the way, there's 18 times. I told you there's four times that it says, I will. There's 18 times in this Psalm where God, where David says, you, Lord, you're, you're, you, you, you. Is David clear who's doing all, all the good things? When was the last time you talked to somebody and you couldn't even wait to get away because all they're doing is bragging on themselves. I did this and I did this and I did this. And, and uh, if somebody comes and does something bigger than them, they're going to trump them. They're going to they're gonna try to beat them and say, well, I did this. And, you know, part of it's true probably and part of it's not. Well, David's not doing that. David could have said, I'm the king over the greatest nation there ever has been. God said, there's going to be one of my sons on the king of Israel on the throne for the, forever. And he could have just said, I have this, this, and I had, I had a little rock in my hand and I killed the giant Goliath. When my brothers were too scared to run down the hill and do that. He could have done all that. But in this Psalm, he doesn't say me, 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 I, I, I. He says 18 times, you, 
you, you. Oh. The second part of this, it starts in verse 3, and it's God's character. God's character. David says, when my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before you. If you're a Bible scholar, you know Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy 28 says that if God's people would follow him and trust him, that the Lord would cause their enemies to rise up against you, to be defeated before you. They will come out against you one way and they will flee. What's the rest of that? Seven ways. All you have to do is trust me, Israel. And when the enemy comes to attack you, they're going to come in one way and I'm going to scatter them and make them go out seven different ways running away from you. That was a promise that God gave Israel. I will fight for you. How many of the battles in the Old Testament when it was time to fight against some of the enemies of God, did God say, just stand still. You won't even have to fight in this. Stand still and see the salvation of God. And that's what David is making clear here. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before you. For you have maintained my just cause. We hear a lot today about rights. I have my rights. I have my right to do this and I have my right to do this. Uh, we need to hold those rights very loosely because the only things that we truly have are what's given to us from God. Uh, the rights that a country, a constitution, a law of a land may give us, they're, uh, they're not eternal. They're not constant. They can change. But David says here, you have maintained my just cause. You have sat on the throne judging righteously You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You've blotted out their name forever and ever. The enemy has come to an end in perpetual ruins. You have uprooted the cities. The very memory of them is perished. Now, in several verses there, David is saying, let me tell you what God's done. Let me tell you what God has done. The enemies came after me, but God took care of them. How would you like to know this God who always has a just cause and he takes up that just cause for us? How would you like to know in our court system in the United States that whenever anyone went to the court system, it would always come out right, fair, and just? Would that not be something? I'm hearing more stories all the time, perhaps you are, of people that have been in prison for a lot of years And now that we have DNA testing, they're able to find out, wait a minute, the DNA that was at the crime scene doesn't match. We've got the wrong person in jail and then we see them being released. I wonder how many people are in jail, prison right now that are innocent. I wonder how many people are guilty that aren't in jail, that aren't in prison. And David's saying here, when God judges, he judges it perfectly every time. He doesn't make any mistakes. He doesn't need DNA testing. He knows the right from the wrong. He knows what I've done. He knows what you've done. In fact, Psalm 139 says that he knows our thoughts before we ever have them. That's pretty good, isn't it? I think my mama had some of that because she knew what us kids were going to do sometimes before we did it. I don't know how. You mamas, you kind of scare me just a little bit because God gives you something special. Notice the things that he said that God had, had done. He said the enemies were made to stumble. They perished. You judged them. You rebuked them. You rest- destroyed them. You blotted out their name forever. The enemy has come to an end in perpetual ruins. You have uprooted the cities and the very memory of them has perished. My question for myself and for you here tonight is, what nation, what people, what civilization of all time? You can go to any part of history that we know of. What people group, nation, civilization 
anywhere around the world of all time has withstood God, has fought against him, has rejected his word, his people, the prophets, or Jesus and the apostles, the New Testament, that is still around today that has not had these same things happen to them? Is there anyone in all of history? Is there any nation that's made it all through? They rejected God. They cursed God. They're atheistic. They're their own God. There's not one. You can go back all through history and any group of people that chose to fight against God, to mock God, to say no to him, God did these same things. He rebuked them. He destroyed them. He blots out their name. They come to an end. There's perpetual ruins. We go on vacation and, and visit some of their rocks, don't we? There's ruins left standing, some of them. The Roman Empire was a powerful, powerful nation. They were the superpower. Perhaps you've studied about the, the Pax Romana. And it was, we're so strong, we're going to cause world peace. You remember that thing that every girl that's in a beauty pageant answers when they say, what would you like? World peace. Well, Rome almost got it done, but you know how they did it? With fear and with force and with military might, they tried to force people to not cause trouble. But where's Rome today? Where's Rome today? The mighty, mighty Romans. They're in our history books. David says here, this is what God does when he has enough, when he fights against the enemy. There's a war there's a real war going on, but God is able to stop that war. Verse seven says, but the Lord abides forever. Those nations aren't here anymore, but God is. Those kings aren't here anymore, but God's word still is. There are people that have said, my life goal is to destroy this, this Bible. I'm gonna burn them all. I'm gonna destroy them. I'm gonna keep them. In fact, a lot of the manuscripts, we have over 5,000 manuscripts of the Old Testament that have been written uh, since the early centuries. How many tens of thousands probably were there that got destroyed? Uh, I love to read about some of that, that when they came and they found a church or a place where they had studied God's word, we heard you have a Bible. We want it. We heard you have a, an Old Testament Hebrew writings. We want it. And oftentimes the people in charge would go get one of Josephus's book or they would go get one of the other writings of, of the time and they would say, well, here it is. And they thought they were getting the inspired scriptures. They weren't at all because God preserved those 5,800 manuscripts. Corey, I'm asking him about that, 5,800. You know why? Because I needed to read them and you needed to read them. God's not out of ways of taking care of those things and all those nations and all those kings that said, we're gonna destroy this they're all gone. Did you know you can go to the grave where Stalin is at? Stalin said, we need communism. We're going to fight against everybody else. We're our God. You can go to that. And they say that on his tomb, crypt, wherever his bones have been laid, there's an inscription that says, he was the savior of the world. Isn't that interesting? You can go to what we think is or very possibly the tomb where Jesus was laid or if it's not, it's close there somewhere. And guess what about that tomb? It's empty. He's not there. King Louis the Fourteenth. I was studying about him just a little bit because when he died, Tommy mentioned it this morning, he wanted a single candle. He wanted his funeral to be dark everywhere, but he wanted a single candle right by his face so that when everyone walked by, they could see how great he was and it would only illuminate his face. And uh, at the end of that service, the archbishop came up and grabbed that candle and he went, Phew. and he said, only God is great. I love that. I was reading about him some this week. You know how many baths King Louis the Fourteenth took in his whole life? 
Three baths, because doctors convinced him when he was young that that's how you get sick. If you take baths a lot, you get sick. And what, isn't that good to be known for that? Three baths. That sounds like my little boy when he was little. <laughs> he would have been, he'd been fine with that. I think he takes three baths a day today. But God through David is saying, I'm gonna take care of the war. When the enemy comes and they mock my word and they mock my people and they reject and they fight against, God is able to stop the bad guys. Verse seven, but the Lord abides forever. He has established his throne for judgment and he will judge the world in righteousness. When God does it, it'll be fair. He will execute judgment for the peoples with an equity. There's gonna be a time when God says, I'm changing things. And Israel's going to have those great words that we read about. They're going to beat their plowshares into pruning hooks. Uh, and they're going to study war no more. God is going to bring on this earth peace for a thousand years. When I do a funeral, I always stand at the head of the casket. Almost always the caskets are, let me see where I'm at here. They're, they're faced this way. Yes, this way. The head here and the feet that way with the body facing where if they were alive, they could see the east. Because Jesus said when the Son of Man returns, it's gonna be like the lightning that comes out of the east and goes all the way to the west. So we bury people facing toward the east. There's gonna be a moment in time when God says all these graves are gonna be open. And some of those graves are going to be instantly with Jesus. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. You remember that video I showed you a few weeks ago? Made everybody jump. When the rapture took place, the guy's Bible falls on the ground and there's a few people in a room like this left and they start thinking, oh no, it was true. Oh no, I wasn't ready. That day is going to come. And there's going to be another day when all the graves are going to be open and we'll have to stand before the Lord. So David's saying, God will execute judgment for his people with equity. The Lord will also, verse 9, will be a stronghold for the oppressed. I don't know about you, but I have always had a heart, not that I could get all of it done, but I've always had a heart for the little one, the underdog. I would stand up for the kid in school that looked different and walked different and ate mayonnaise with his beans. I don't know how you do that. I'm sorry, I don't want to offend anybody, but do you eat mayonnaise on your beans? And he would eat them with his knife. And so all the kids are making fun of him, and they're laughing and everything, and I just couldn't stand it. And the big old tough guys, and I wasn't a big old tough guy, but I'd go stand with him, and they'd look at me like, what are you doing that for? Well, God does, and I'm glad. He'll be a stronghold for the oppressed. He's the protector of the weak, the small, the downtrodden, the hurt. He knows who he created, and he's ready to help those who are mistreated. God can see the single person and the single need. You may be here like I've been before, and God, God's word is so powerful, and the Holy Spirit works like you may feel like you're the only one in this room tonight. No matter where you're sitting, you may think, he's talking about me. He doesn't know me. How does he know that? It's not me. That's what God does sometimes. He can see the individual person, the individual need. And men and women, I want to encourage you. There's a war going on. There's a war of the worlds. Because Christ came to die on the cross for you and me. He was raised from the dead. And he's given the Holy Spirit to fight all the battles for us. And there's nothing as powerful as God. But we have an enemy who didn't want you to come to church tonight who doesn't want you to pay attention to these words that we're reading out of the Bible. He wants you to call him anything, just don't obey him. There's a war of the worlds still going on. And it's not fake news this time. It's not a fake invasion this time. It's real. David says the Lord will be a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Verse 10, and those who know your name will put their trust in you. I heard about a little child one time and she had gone through a tough time, things that little children should never have seen. And she'd come out pretty well and, 
And they, they showed her a picture of something, a depiction of Jesus. We don't know what Jesus looked like. It's probably good that we didn't have cameras because some of us would worship his picture. And some of us would think, uh, I look more like Jesus than you do, so I'm a better person, you know, that kind of thing. We'd argue and divide somehow. But they showed this little girl. They said, this is kind of a picture of what Jesus might look like. Do you know him? And she said, I knew who he was, but I didn't know his name. Is that possible? You mom and daddies, have you seen God work in your children, your grandchildren in a way, even before, you know, there's all the kinds of discussions about an age of accountability, but I'm telling you something, God can work in those little ones at any age. And David's saying here, he's a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name will put their trust in you for you, O Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Can you show me any time in the New Testament that someone came to Christ that Christ refused them? Can you show me any, any time where they cried out to God and God said, nope, next? There wasn't. All that will come to him, all that will call upon him. If you wonder what your name is, is my name in the Bible? Yes, it is, whosoever. Whosoever, I'm so glad I'm a whosoever. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Your name's in there and mine is too. I want to read real quickly uh, some of the history and prophecies of the book of Daniel. It's about in the late 500s BC. I want to go down real quickly. These are all things that were prophesied. This is going to take place someday. And every one of them, because it's going to start about 580 something BC, and we're going to fly right past where you and I live today all the way to the end of time. Let me do it real quickly. But this is just like a history of the world, okay? All given to Daniel. Daniel said that Nebuchadnezzar was going to have his wings plucked. Babylon was going to lose its power. The Medo-Persia conquest of Babylon, they're going to come and take over this Babylon, the superpower that Nebuchadnezzar reigned over. That happened. Then Persia was going to be raised up over the Medes. That happened. Then Greece was going to be the superpower. They were allowed to come up, and they were to, to rule the world. That happened. Then there's a guy named Alexander the Great, and he was destined, he thought, to rule the whole world. He had an early death. I think he died the same age as Jesus. He was that great horn. Uh, it was prophesied 200 years before Alexander the Great was born that this guy was going to come. He had four generals take over. They each started working at different places, and they were the one to go to. They were the people that, that, that uh, had their own like countries, their own world, their own kingdoms. Then we hear about a guy named Ante uh, Antiochus Epiphanes. I used to call it Antiochus something when I was a kid. Antiochus Epiphanes, who arises over Syria, prophesied before he'd ever get there. And it came about just like, it, like God said in his word. Then you have a six and a half year Maccabean revolt of Israel against the Syrians. They whip them. Then Rome arises. And I'll bet the Romans thought we are the final one. We are the ones that are going to rule forever. Rome was defeated. Uh, they were divided into east and west divisions, two legs. You got Rome, uh, Rome and Constantinople. Then we come all the way to Christ, Jesus, and his death on the Calvary. I want to tell you something. There was a war of the worlds that day. There was a war of the worlds on that Friday that Jesus was crucified. He's raised from the dead. There's going to be a time in the future. Israel is scattered. Uh, they're going to come back and be rejoined, rebuild the temple. The Antichrist is going to raise up a ten-nation confederacy. These are all things in the future now. He's going to lie to Israel, try to make them a covenant, an agreement. He's going to go back on his word. There's going to be persecution of Israel for seven years in the tribulation time. Jesus Christ is coming back, just like we talked about a moment ago. Man is going to be judged, and the establishment of Christ's kingdom over the, all the earth is going to take place. Just like God told Daniel... Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. There's never been a nation. There's never been a kingdom. There's never been a people fight against God that weren't defeated. God's still here and they are not. Throughout all history, those that wanted to destroy God's plan and God's purpose 
have failed. Now, there's a little country, though, that's been around for thousands of years. And their name has not been destroyed. They are not just part of the history books. They're still around today. And it's a little country. It doesn't have a lot of natural resources over there. There's not a lot of reason why you'd want to be a part of this country. It's right up next to the sea. And, and there's not a lot, really, that people would desire. And it's called Israel. And God had made a promise with that little country through Abraham a long time ago. That there were going to be descendants like the sand of the seashore, like the stars of the sky. I'm going to make you a great nation. And through you, Abraham, all the nations, America, are going to be blessed through your seed, Jesus. One guy was talking about, well, I'm not a believer. I don't believe in all this stuff. But I tell you what, one of the greatest arguments to believe is that there's still an Israel. There's still Jews around. Because for 4,500 years, people have been trying to eradicate that country. Right where we live today, there are people that want them blown off the face of the map. And they don't even know why. They want that little country to be destroyed. Well, we know why, because God's word tells us why. There is still a war of the world. Look with me in verse 11. David says, sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Preach it, proclaim it, uh, declare among the peoples his deeds. For he who requires blood remembers them. God's going to right all the wrongs. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. God hears the little guy's prayers. Aren't you glad? He hears the little guy's prayers. And 13, be gracious to me, O Lord. See my affliction from those who hate me. You who lift me up from the gates of death. My daughter and I both like a singer, Josh Groban. I'm sure you know who that is. And for several years, one of his songs was very popular, You Raise Me Up. I don't know who Josh was singing to when he sang that song, but I want to remind you of some of the words. When I'm down and oh, my soul so weary. When troubles come and my heart burdened be, then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I'm strong when I'm on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. I don't know who he's singing to or singing about in that song, but when I hear it, I think about the Lord. When I'm still, I've got troubles. I don't know what tomorrow holds. I need help. And I want to sit a while and have him come and sit with me. Psalm 4610, I bet you know it. Be still and know that I am God. Why does it say know that I'm God? Because the more still you are and quiet and you let him come sit beside you, you're going to get to know him better. Be still and know that I am God. David said, you lift me up. And that's what God does for us. Verse 14, that I may tell of your praises, your powerful testimony, that in the gates of the daughter of Zion, I am, may rejoice in your salvation. David had been saying you, 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 you all the time. Now he's saying me, 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 I, I, because it's his personal God. You may be sitting here tonight and you had the most godly parent there ever has walked the face of the earth. That's wonderful. There was a pastor's wife not long ago that was asked, do you know the Bible? She said, my husband does. Is that good enough? Are you a Christian? Well, my, my grandmother played the organ in the church for 40 years. And that's supposed to be like you get a, a free ticket, pass go, $200 free ticket into heaven. When you get up there to heaven and they say, why should I let you into to this heavenly kingdom? Well, my dad, my dad, he went to Promise Keepers and he had men's Bible study. He was so faithful and he even taught Sunday school for a little while and it's not gonna be like that, is it? David turns and he says, me, me, I, this God that I've been talking about, this Lord that's going to rebuke all the nations and stop the war of the worlds, he's my God. When David wrote those beautiful words, the Lord is my shepherd. I heard about a little boy 
who was struggling with all kinds of uh, illnesses and and a man went to witness to him and he shared Christ with him and he thought, I don't know whether the boy understands anything. You ever been there? We have one of the guys that works in our department and volunteers and he goes to the rest homes and they wheel one man in all the time. He's in his bed. He's like this all the time. And this man teaches a story out of the gospels. He's done it for years and years. And he thought, I don't know whether this man ever hears anything. One day he was talking about Calvary and he said, what's the other name for Calvary? And, and the teacher forgot. He said, I was going to tell him, but I forgot what it was. And so at the, he said, I'll remember it in a little while. He got through the lesson. He had forgotten what it was. And this guy that's been there for years, just like this in his bed, they're about to wheel him out. And he passes by the teacher and he says, Golgotha. And puts his head back down. And John, the teacher said, he's been hearing it all. He caught everything. All these years, it didn't look like it, but he knew it all. And that's what God wants us to be. He wants us to be people of the word. He wants us to be people of faith. That little boy, that the man wasn't sure he could understand anything, but he shared the gospel with him. And he would do it like this. He would say, the Lord is my shepherd. And the mama thought, what are you doing? You know, you're maybe wasting your time. But he would say, the Lord is my shepherd. And one day... When the man came to visit with the, the, the young boy, the mom was so excited. Hurry, get in there. He wants to show you something. What do you mean he wants to show me something? And we got in there. The little boy had done this. He'd grabbed this finger like this. The Lord is my shepherd. And he had trusted in Christ. Isn't that good? That's what David said. He's my Lord. He's my God. He's your Lord. He's your God. And he's the one who can stop the war of the worlds. That in the gates of the daughter of Zion, I may rejoice in your salvation. The nations have sucked down in the pit, which they have made in the net, which they hid. Their own foot has been caught. Be careful. There's a recurring theme all the way through the scripture. They that, that dig a pit will fall therein. Haman, build your gallows. You'll get hung on your own gallows. As you have done, so shall it be done unto you. We got to be careful. If we wish harm for somebody, God can turn that back on us. And he said, they dug a pit, but they got caught in in their own. The Lord made himself known. He's executed judgment in the work of his hands. The wicked are snared. The nations had begun a fight in the war of the worlds that they couldn't finish. The last part of this psalm, there's only two outcomes. The wicked will return to Sheol. That's good, the grave, death even all the nations who forget God, for the needy will not always be forgotten nor the hope of the afflicted perish forever. There's only two lists. The wicked's gonna be destroyed and the faithful will be with God and they'll be protected. The final prayer is 19 and 20. Arise, O Lord, do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations know. Look at, listen to this last phrase. Let the nations know that they are but men. Do you think sometimes mankind gets a little too proud and we think too much of ourselves? Is God able to make us realize who we are? Can he give us an attitude adjustment? My dad was able to do that. If any of us boys thought we were getting a little bit too tough, a little bit too smart aleck, he was able to give us a little training so that we knew and had a better perspective of who we are. There's only two lists. If you've ever gone through a Titanic exhibit, I'm almost through. You go and see artifacts that have been taken up, uh, that's 107 years ago, off that ship that sunk. The ship that, that a man said, even God cannot sink this ship. 107 years ago. And you go through and they have a stateroom there you can see in the first class, second class. You can see different things. You see clocks that were... Uh, when they went in the water, they, they were frozen in time right there. It's pretty impactful. It's powerful. But almost all the exhibits, when you get to the end, you go into a room, and on one side is a whole lot of names on one wall and a whole lot of names on the other wall. And what you do, because they've given you a ticket, you, you uh, look for your name on the ticket that you had, and you go find out which wall you're on. And you know what the walls were? The saved and the lost. There's only two walls. 
there's only two sides. And you and I here tonight, just like David in Psalm chapter nine, there's a lot of enemies, God. There's a war of the worlds and the enemy doesn't want you and I to be on God's side. There's no doubt about that. But David's saying, here's what's gonna happen to the wicked. Here's what's gonna happen to those that fight against God. But for those that will call upon God's name and trust in him, he's their stronghold. He'll take care of his own. Men and women, every one of us in this room are on one of two lists. Those people that got on that ship 107 years ago thought they would go home in a few days, back to their families, back to their jobs, and back to their lives. They didn't know that was their last chance. Every one of us in this room are on one list or another. And tonight, you and I have time. May not have much more, who knows? But you and I have time to make sure that the war of the worlds that's going on, and it's still going on today, that that war can be won in our heart. God's ready to do that. Some of you may say, I did it a long time ago. By God's grace, I'm saved. And if I were to die right now, I want to go be with him. And I want to say, praise God, brother, sister, whoever you are. If you get there before I do, tell him hi. I'll be there soon. Tell him thank you, fall down, love him. But honestly, if you're not sure, there's no better night than tonight. This Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now's the accepted time. And if you're not sure you're saved, you can be sure before you leave tonight. There's a war going on. God's already won it for us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for David. He kept saying, you, you, your power, your might, your strength. Because David knew he couldn't get this accomplished himself. He knew there was a war too big for him. He knew there was a battle too strong for him. And Lord, we and our pride as human beings often as the man of the Old Testament said, let not him who puts on his armor boast as him who takes it off. Sometimes we boast before the fight of all that we're gonna do and we don't get it done. But we saw in this Psalm here tonight, Lord, you got it done. You're a stronghold we can run to. You are faithful and you're just and you're righteous. You hear the little guy's prayer and those that would fight against you will not win. They never have throughout all of history and they never will. Give us courage in the time we live today to be like David. I will tell of God's wonders. I will tell of God's might. I'll not be ashamed. I'll not be afraid. I will tell the great things God has done. And Father, we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.